Hi, everybody. Good evening, and welcome, of course, to the Minnesota Zoo and our World Speaker Series. My name is Sven Sungard, and if you don't know who I am, I'm the Sunrise Meteorologist on CARE 11. I do the morning show. I know some people aren't up early. I envy you. Um, I've been off this whole week, so it's been great waking up late and staying up past dark. I feel, I feel like a kid whose parents aren't home. Uh, we would like to thank the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment, which provides funding to make this event free for all of you to attend. Uh, obviously, many of you probably know this, but a ton of cool things that come out of that amendment. Uh, additional thanks to the media sponsor for the series, MinPost. Please check out their Earth Journal blog, which covers environmental issues in the news. You know, there's a lot of that with a special emphasis on solutions to environmental challenges. Um, some of you were in the last uh, room that I was in, and uh, I had the privilege of heading to Namibia in July, and I'm going to give you just kind of a little summary of why on earth I ended up there. Um, picture it. Uh, early June, I get an email from the zoo that says, hey, we saw you do this really cool stuff with the polar bears last fall. I don't know if some of you saw that. Uh, I did a series of uh, stories on polar bears in the subarctic of Canada and some of the issues they're facing with climate change. And they said, did you know that the zoo works with Save the Rhino Trust in Namibia, helping to save rhinos? And I'm like, no, that's not a logical connection I would have ever made. And they asked, would I want to go? And I literally had just got back from the Middle East. And I'm like, let me figure this out. Was able to make it work. Uh, a few weeks later, I was in South Africa for the first time ever, and on my way to Namibia, where I met Jeff, who you're going to hear from here, and he's going to give you all the really cool, geeky details on uh, rhino conservation. But where I kind of come in as, as the storyteller, uh, to be able to bring to not just you guys, but to our wider audience in Minnesota and Wisconsin, that CARE 11 viewers reach, the story that I think a lot of people don't know about. We all know how great the Minnesota Zoo is, but we don't know just how great they are. And we're going to be really tooting our horn here uh, tonight and through November. So I want you to watch for November. We're going to be airing a, a bigger piece, what we call an extra in our 10 o'clock newscast. I don't have a date yet, so you just got to watch every night in November. <laughs> but it's going to be really cool. And uh, saw several rhinos, saw desert adapted elephants. It is really such a cool place in Africa. If any of you are lucky enough to have the chance to go, and we're gonna do some uh, breakout pieces that will go more in depth into some of the issues facing rhinos and maybe some other issues uh, in terms of Namibia. And I have a one minute little trailer here that's kind of a teaser for you uh, as to what we can expect here coming up in November. Um, so obviously we're going to go way more in depth than you can learn a lot, but you're also going to learn a lot from Jeff, who is a guy who's been there 14 years in Namibia? Close enough. Yeah. Close enough. Uh, pretty long time, and I had the pleasure of spending some time with him, and he's going to tell you a lot about the great work that the Minnesota Zoo is doing there. Please welcome Jeff Montfering. Um, thank you guys again all for coming. Um, I don't feel like I need to say anything now. That was so wonderful. Um, we, can, we can all go home now. Um, no, the, the one thing that Sven probably would um, never tell you that I think is so impressive actually about his work besides a great video is that Sven actually came all the way to Namibia, did all this great work um, on his own dime, his own pocket. And I think we should all just give Sven a round of applause for that. Thanks, Ryan. So tonight, um, I think some of you probably heard me speak, and, and often um, I end up talking about a lot about these guys, um, which I guess makes sense. Um, that is what we're off in Namibia uh, to try and save. Um, but often the stories and the people that make all this work possible get sort of left in the background. And this is what I want to talk about tonight. Um, some of these amazing trackers uh, that we get to work with every day and that have really been, been my inspiration. So I've got a lot to say as usual, um, so I'm going to get started here. And what I want to do is I want to actually start with a question. And I want you guys to raise your hand, tell me how many of you would consider helping save an endangered species from extinction? 
Pretty cool? Sound pretty cool? Keep, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. I've got a few more questions now. How many would still want to save endangered species if you'd have to hike? I'm not going to tell you how much yet. <laughs> you might know where this is going. Um, sometimes you actually get to sit on a donkey though. Some people might like that, but I can promise you eight hours on a homemade saddle is not all that comfortable. But, okay, we still have a few people who are keen. That's good. How about if the train was a little bit unfriendly? This is sort of commonplace in our area. Here's uh, one of our teams down here. Um, but yes, you might get a few blisters. That's, uh, that's not my toe. Um, and, and oh yeah, by the way, uh, we're talking about 120 degrees, kind of average. And uh, you, you see that landscape? Lots of shade. No, there's no shade there. Uh, it's, it, it's pretty hot, uh, to say the least. Oh, and by the way, um, this is going to require you to be out for a minimum of 20 days a month, camping, offline. And when I mean camping, I don't mean like big fancy tents, big RV trailers. Um, this is the, the, the night bed here. Um, not the most comfortable. So, happy guy with a cell phone? Mm -mm. Happy guy in the shower? No. Game of Thrones? Sorry guys. And that lovely cappuccino in the morning? Uh, not so lucky. So, we got a few hands still up? You can bring a camera. You can bring a camera. How about the food? We all like a nice home-cooked meal, right? Eh, not on these patrols, guys. This is usually what... Uh, highlight of the day. We call this bully beef in Namibia, but you might know it as spam. If we're really lucky, we get an ostrich egg. Mmm, that'll feed us for actually about three or four days. But we only take one, of course. And if we're really, really lucky, we get to chase away the hyenas and steal a bit of uh, their hard-earned uh, antelope kill. Um, so yeah, food, food is not sort of to die for. But don't forget about the other friendly neighbors out there that might not be so happy to see you. Now, this guy, he might be a little bit happy because he might think he's getting a, an easy meal. Um, plenty of elephants, spitting cobras, I've had two of them in my house last year. And then the, the animals that you're actually hoping to protect are also not that excited to see you all the time either. Of course, they don't know you're trying to help them, but... Um, there's also our fellow humans, and I can promise you they are not all Minnesota nice. So, there is a chance that you might run into these guys out in the bush. And some people think, oh yeah, poachers, they're, they're just using old, you know, worthless rifles. Um, take a look at this picture. This, this is... Um, Police that confiscated some weapons from poachers in West Africa. I don't call that, you know, old useless rifles. Uh, there's, there's some serious power uh, going on there. Um, these are people that you might run into. I see a few hands still up. <laughs> wow, oh yeah, yeah, no, sorry, sorry. We're still, we're still going. After all this, we still get a good paycheck, right? Mmm, not so much. <laughs> Unfortunately, our trackers earn about 200 US bucks a month, a little bit extra if they see a lot of rhinos. Um, and this, to be honest, is actually a fairly decent salary um, for rhino protectors. However, given the money that poachers are offering them, uh, here we sit with a, with a slight problem. So we do still have a few hands up. That's great. Um, you guys can give me your CVs uh, in a little bit. Um, because this is exactly what our guys are doing every single day um, throughout the year in Namibia. And it's an absolute privilege for me um, to be able to work with these, uh, these amazing, amazing guys. And they're out there uh, busting their backside just for these guys, these cute, uh, adorable uh, black rhinos. And not only is their job difficult, but they have to cover a pretty massive area. We're talking about here in northwest Namibia, um, Sven gave us a nice shot of where Namibia is on the map, but this area in blue is the range of the black rhino that 
Save the Rhino Trust and the communities have to cover. Now, if I told you that was about 5 million acres, you might say, oh yeah, that's pretty big. But when we look at it actually relative to Minnesota, you even get a bigger sense of how big of an area it is that we have to monitor from south of the metro all the way up past Lake Mille Lacs, around Brainerd, all the way north down past St. Cloud. It's a massive, massive area that our guys of about 40 um, have to try and cover. So why are we doing all of this? And, and what's all the fuss about with rhinos? Well, rhinos have had a very tough time. You can see this map, all of this in, in yellow is their historical distribution. The red stuff is where they're at about now. Uh, fortunately, their population has gone up a little bit over the past few years. We're now sitting at about 5,000. But between 1950 and 1990, 96% of the world's black rhinos were wiped out purely by poachers. It's an absolute terrible story. And most of that historically was driven by the demand for the use of just their horn in traditional Chinese medicine, a 2,000 year old practice. More recently, things are getting even worse. Now you can see down here, between 2000 and 2006, the number of rhinos poached in South Africa was quite low. And this is about when I arrived on the scene here in 2002. I didn't know what poaching was, was all about at all. I was like, oh, well, you know, we're, we're doing a great job here. Um, but around 2007, things changed. And what we picked up on, there was a handful of exp explanations about what led to this huge poaching increase. But what's scary now is that there's been some good trends that traditional Chinese medicine has actually put out a lot of successful campaigning to reduce their consumption of rhino horns. But things like the antiquity market in China has picked up. And with the rising middle class, giving a very rare expensive gift is seen as a very respectful act and a, and a, and a status symbol. And this is becoming the main threat right now to rhinos. And recently here, this is just South Africa, and these are just the rhinos that they know about. 1,200 rhinos, three rhinos a day, currently being poached uh, across Africa. So what are we doing about it? Well, in Namibia, we have taken a very unconventional approach. And whereas most countries in Africa have always, and still today, see local people as part of the problem. These are the people that they most often find and arrest in the field trying to poach rhinos. And to them, poaching is the problem. And the response has been, Military, bring in the military. We gotta fight fire with fire. This is a war. This is a war. But Namibia had a very different approach. And we said, wait a minute. It's not really the local people are the problem. These people that are poaching, they're, they're just hungry. You know, they're trying to feed their families. But these are the people that know where the rhinos are. These are the people that know the forest, that know the, the desert. These should be our allies. And if they're just trying to feed their families, maybe we can actually turn them into protectors, and that's exactly what happened. And 35 years ago, when Save the Rhino Trust was formed, this was completely new. Nobody was doing this. And you see a few of these guys here. This is a lady named Blythe Luti. She was a South African-born um, uh, uh, lady from, from Natal. And she said, I'm going to actually go bail some of these guys out of jail, because they're the ones that are going to help us save these rhinos, not the army. And that's how all of this started. That's how all of this shift from enforcement-based to incentive-based conservation began. So we're not saying get away from all this. You know, no, nobody would say the way we're gonna solve crime is to get rid of the police. No, that's completely ridiculous. But what we're saying is for the police and for law enforcement to be effective, they have to be protecting something that people value. We value safety and security, so oftentimes we are willing to help the police. If local people don't value a resource, if they don't value the rhinos, how is the law enforcement going to really be effective? And that's why we're trying to shift that balance by focusing on a few of these other initiatives so that we don't find ourselves in that situation. This is one of the last known northern white rhinos. And this is the extent that they had to go through, 24 hours a day being protected by armed guards. In Namibia, we're talking about empowering local communities, getting them to see and attach more value to keeping rhinos alive. So this, this effort sort of reached a new level 
um, in 2012, mainly by a lot of effort actually based right here in Minnesota. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that more later. But what we call this is, is the Rhino Ranger Program. And this is actually part of a big shift from not only people working for Save the Rhino Trust protecting rhinos, but actually getting communities themselves to organize and to find their own people who they're going to hold accountable to protect their rhinos. What we were offering to do is to transfer our skills from Save the Rhino Trust and the Minnesota Zoo to help train and equip and motivate these new community trackers to look after their own rhinos. And the first step was um, to improve their rhino monitoring. The guys needed to know where their rhinos were out on their land. Um, and we were able to share you know, 35 years of experience in, in how to do that. So the guys got to know their rhinos. Then a few years ago we said, let's also then take it a step further and get these guys involved in tourism. Save the Rhino Trust started a unique partnership back in 2003 with a, with a very um, successful tourism company called Wilderness Safaris. Um, we call it Desert Rhino Camp. Some of you I know have been there before. Amazing, amazing experience. But it's about integrating a conservation organization that has a particular skill, finding a rhino, and a business that also has a particular skill, taking care of people and taking them out into the bush and keeping them safe. A very good marriage. Um, so we wanted to pass on those skills to the communities so that they could also take advantage and continue to see more benefits from having rhinos. And what we're moving towards now, which is very exciting, is also expanding these community trackers um, into some new work which is going beyond just the rhinos, beyond just their work of monitoring, but also engaging their own fellow communities, uh, community members, their own um, children in many cases in, in, in rhinos, understanding what, what is threatening rhinos, understanding what they have to lose if they don't put a stop to poaching. Um, so we're very excited about this new uh, campaign that we're actually going to be partnering with the Houston Zoo on uh, coming up this year. So who are these people uh, that make all of this possible? And I wanted just to share, share with you guys a few stories uh, from some, some great individuals that I've had the pleasure of working with for quite a while. And I have to start with uh, this guy here. This guy is Simpson Kudipop. You guys can practice that a little bit later. <laughs> He is a local Damar speaking individual from the area. Simpson grew up with goats and became a welder. That was his profession. He came uh, to save the Rhino Trust 25 years ago to assist with their mechanics. He was going to help weld the little field things in camp. And over the years, he was able to move up, was able to go to school, get a master's degree, and he is now the CEO of Save the Rhino Trust. He is the face of this organization. He's part of the IUCN Rhino Specialist Group. He is respected by every single community member. Whenever there's an issue about rhino, they don't call the government. They don't call the police. They call this guy. They call Simpson, and hopefully we'll be able to actually bring him here someday so he can talk to people. He's a, he's a great guy. And he's got this great story. One of his other gifts is doing swan dives. And everybody who's tracked rhino for especially 25 years has a story about rhinos charging. And Simpson tells this great story. These are um, native euphorbia bushes, and they have this toxic milky latex inside of them. And one big rhino was uh, right behind Simpson, and the best thing he could think to do at the time was literally dive into this bush. So if you can imagine, this guy's about six foot five. <laughs> running, swan diving straight into this huge plant, coming out full of this white, milky stuff, laughing his, his head off. Thankfully, the rhino ran around the bush, but um, that's dedication for you. Another guy that, in my opinion, is probably the most impressive, dedicated individual is a guy named Ludwig Ganesev. We all call him Maniki, um, or the general. And this guy has been working for 20 years, not as long as Simpson, but he works on a team that operates in the roadless area. So every month, remember those, those uh, statistics before, 20 days, every month, for 20 years, this guy is out away from his family. He has a wife and kids, just like a lot of us. I just did some quick crude math, and, and based upon some, some very you know, conservative numbers, 5,000 days out on patrol. 36,000 miles this guy has probably walked at least on foot in those mountains. 
So I know this for a fact because I have this information, 6,782 rhino sightings. Incredibly impressive. Just to put that into perspective, 36,000 miles is basically like walking around the earth one and a half times. Now, imagine doing that with lions, with cobras, walking up and down those hills. Um, amazing work, uh, just for rhinos. Another one of my good friends, uh, Dan Siki, we both sort of started about the same time. He was a little bit younger than me, um, but really just a, a great guy. Also a Dahmer speaker from, from the area. Um, Dan Siki will always be close to my heart because he taught me how to ride a donkey. Um, you know, these guys grew up, a lot of them herding their goats, so he's an amazing, um, you know, amazingly nimble on his donkey. He, he, he liked uh, to laugh when mine would take me into the tree, but um, when I first met Dan, Dan Siki, he could barely speak English. Very, very crude, rudimentary English. And one of the amazing things about Dan Siki is after Desert Rhino Camp opened, um, it was a few years before he went out there, but we started doing a, a lunchtime program with the guests out there. Now, really, these are high paying guests. These guests are paying six, seven hundred US dollars a day to come to this camp. They, they expect, they expect performance. Within about six months, Dan Siki, who could barely speak English at the beginning, was giving a full 15 minute presentation to these guests in English. It was, it was, it's amazing how fast these guys can, can pick things up. And, and I can tell, I can tell you that the guests were absolutely astonished, even if he slipped up on a, on a few words. But this is part of our work too, to, um, you know, improve the value that these guys attach to their work because they're able to share what they're doing with the guests on a daily basis and the guests are able to then give them feedback. So these guys really feel like their work means something. Um, and it's another great contribution that tourism provides. I still to this day have not figured out how to say Epson's first name. If, any, if anybody can, um, power to you. Um, but this guy, it, it, sorry I don't have a better picture of him, but, but there, I can't believe he's 50 years old either. The guy looks like he's, he's younger than me. Um, but he's with, been with Save the Rhino Trust seven years. And what's amazing about Epson is that this guy is like a gray, is like a like a hound dog when he's out on the, in the field, and he doesn't speak a, a word of English. But what he does speak is rhino and tracking. This guy is an incredible tracker. And in June last year, they were out on patrol, and Epson found some boot tracks on top of the rhino track that he was tracking. Now, typically, it's just our teams that are out in the field, so the alarm bells went off. He started to worry, then he saw some blood also on the rhino track, so he knew something was wrong. He climbed up this mountain. Now, it, it, it's not a lot of scale there, but I can promise you that's a, that's a pretty big mountain. And he made a phone call to our headquarters to say what he had seen. Within 15 minutes, the alarm call went out to the police stations. They blockaded all of the roads heading out of that area. They didn't even find the carcass yet, mind you. This is, this is all just happening based on tuition. But a few hours later, they arrested these three guys with a rhino horn and a rifle in their car. It was only the day later they actually find that, that rhino carcass. So just because of Epson's ability to track and his commitment to climb a mountain, it was the only way he could get cell phone signals. So I was lying a bit before. Sometimes you can get cell phone signal if you, if you work a little bit hard. Um, but again, just demonstrates how local people can actually help solve this problem. Another guy that I find amazing is, uh, is a guy named Chips. I mean, just the name is great, but um, he's one of our Rhino Rangers. He's only been with us about four years. Um, and part of our training, like I said, was on Rhino monitoring. And this is, a, this is Boss, this is a, our team leader who are our field coordinator, and he leads a lot of the training, and he was taking these guys now out for one of their first patrols. And the way this whole thing works is we approach them on foot, we've got our cameras ready, we get close enough to the rhino, and then we take our pictures. And when Boss was with these guys, he was demonstrating. But when he turned around to see if the guys were there, he found them a few hundred yards back hiding in a little ditch. This is, this is Chips here. 
Um, you can, if you look really close, he's sort of got this disgusted look on his face, like, what the heck did I get myself into? So it doesn't come always very quickly, but here's a picture that Chips took later on that same patrol. Not too bad for a farmer with a grade three education. And here's one of his latest photos. This, this is one of the best rhino photos I've ever seen. National Geographic, anybody. And by the way, this one is for auction outside. Um, still, one of my favorite photos by a local farmer. Chakara Karujaiva. Also a very interesting story. This guy now is one of our newest trackers. Also used to farm goats. In December 2012, that all changed though and he became connected to rhinos. And he became connected to rhinos because while he was out with his goats, he saw something. He saw a dead rhino. Now, he, you gotta imagine that there's no people out here. He could have easily just walked away from that whole scene, never said anything to anybody. But in fact, he raced back and found a cell phone uh, reception and also phoned for help. And within 24 hours, they were able to get to the village with the police. They found the guy with the horns, with the rifle, and they arrested him. Con um, he, he confessed to everything, all right there, just because this farmer had the willingness um, and the heart to report something that he actually didn't have to do. Um, really impressive, and because of that, now he's got a full-time job with Save the Rhino Trust. We, we want to hang on to these guys. <laughs> Um, one of the last ones that I wanted to talk about is, is something that's also unique, father and son. So as our guys get older, um, you know, we want to obviously try and bring in more young guys. And this is Sebalon and his uh, son Hofni. Sebalon is one of our directors now, um, really an amazing, amazing tracker. And Hofni is now leading tours for his local community. He's one of the first guys um, that are taking guests out. You can just sort of see that rhino there. I'm very proud of him. He's keeping his distance. He's not getting too close. Um, so uh, again, just a, a great combination. So one of the other things that we do um, with all this work is we have to also synthesize. And this is a lot, a lot, of, a lot of my work now is, is, is sort of the easy part, is I, I kind of get to sit in the office while everybody else is out working hard but trying to make sense of all this information so that we can make uh, better informed decisions. So we make a lot of maps. Thanks to the Minnesota Zoo, we've been able to upgrade a lot of our equipment too. This is actually a big 49 inch TV that we're actually able to zoom in on patrols uh, using Google Earth. I mean, you should have saw uh, these guys' faces when we, when we put this thing in there. They were absolutely blown away. They had never seen anything quite like it before. Um, so it's really a, a fascinating, um, way to look at data. Um, and if anybody was wondering, where are all the women? <laughs> um, you know, we have no issues with, with ladies on patrols, but we haven't had much of, a, much of a demand yet. But I'm busy now training in this lady named Baripo um, to actually assist me with a lot of the data management. And I can tell you that she is amazing. She's also a local Herrero lady. This is the Herrero dress. They, they have these headsets that sort of look like uh, cattle because of their cattle culture, but um, she actually has a degree in, in accounting and administration, so she's perfect for entering data, and she enjoys doing it very much, so we're very happy, and as long as we're on ladies, I just had a couple that I wanted to touch on quick, because um, there's also a few, a few ladies that stand out um, in, uh, for their leadership roles, and I already mentioned Desert Rhino Camp. This is Alfreda. She's been managing Desert Rhino Camp now for excuse me, uh, almost four years. And Desert Rhino Camp uh, has won numerous awards, including World's Most Authentic Travel Destination a few years ago at the, the World Tourism Market in, in, in London. She's doing an absolutely fantastic job. Again, up all day, very demanding guests. In the middle of nowhere, this camp is, you know, trying to make ends meet. Um, amazing, amazing work. And I had to put up one other person. Some of you might know this uh, lovely lady uh, as my wife. <laughs> um, but Basilia, besides being Jeff's wife, um, 
is way more important than I am. She actually runs a field program for the other big conservation group in Northwest uh, Namibia called IRDNC, Integrated Rural Development and Nature Conservation. And they are responsible actually for um, supporting all of the communities with all of their conservation efforts. It's actually a, a monumental task. Um, but they do things like governance, enterprise development, um, you know, really the nitty gritty, dirty, difficult things of working with local people. And she has to manage a whole herd of very, very chauvinistic Herrero men. And they're all big and she's very tall, very, very short. So, you know, how she makes it all work is, is beyond me. And she's a, she's a pretty good mom too, by the way. Um, these are our two kids and this is our, our little niece. So how she manages uh, everything in our remote world's end backyard um, is, uh, is, a, is a small miracle. So um, great leaders. And where is all of this getting us? Um, normally I don't talk so much about, um, about data, but the results have been so exciting that I couldn't help myself this time. And I just have to show you a few slides with a few results. Um, so let's look at our, our trends lately in rhino monitoring. Now, from 2014, basically the blue bars show the total numbers of rhino sightings that we're putting out, and the red bars show the total number of individual rhinos that we're seeing. So look at these trends. These are incredibly impressive. This past year, we've more than doubled the number of rhinos that we're seeing now on a monthly basis. Almost 300 rhinos, and we're seeing almost half of our entire rhino population every month. Now, this might not mean a lot to some of you, but we just had one of Africa's top rhino scientists down doing a strategic planning with us. And even a lot of us don't know how we compare with other organizations. But Dr. Rob Brett said, you know, this is one of the most impressive community rhino monitoring achievements in all of Africa. This work that these guys are doing, especially under these conditions, incredibly impression, impressive. And how about our efficiency? So, I don't want to go too much into the numbers, but this squiggly line basically is a crude cost per rhino that Save the Rhino Trust is doing, and these are the numbers of rhino sightings. So what I wanted to point out is, look at in 2016, our, our expected number of rhino sightings is more than doubled, but the cost has been cut in almost half since, since 2011. So we have managed to not only see way more rhinos, but we're doing it for a heck of a lot less. How about community-based contributions? Because this is actually playing a lot, uh, or playing a huge role in some of these achievements. And what this is showing here is the contributions of our rhino ranger teams relative to the Save the Rhino or the NGO. So look at here in 2014, of all the rhino sightings that year, only 62 sightings had rhino rangers on them. 554 were a Save the Rhino Trust, a teeny fraction of community involvement. But look at this in 2015. Now it's almost half a half. And here in 2016, two-thirds of every rhino sighting has community rangers on it. So huge shifts, again, in, in contributions from local people. And how about the trends in protection? You know, look at these figures, almost exponential growth for our community ranger teams in terms of the number of field days, the number of rhino sightings, the number of patrols, everything is going up and up and up, which is exactly um, what we're hoping to achieve. So interesting also with the tourism, as part of our push to try and get the more, uh, some of our more guys in tourism, these are just the, the numbers for um, the average number of rhino sightings per month financed by tourism. So these are rhino sightings that actually we don't have to pay for. In fact, the tourism adds additional money back into the community. Um, and I'll show a few figures on that later. But how about the poaching? This is what everybody's mainly interested in, right? Remember the slides from South Africa? 1,200 rhinos poached in 2014. Well, unfortunately, we had a little spike there in, in 2014. But we're still looking at about 16. But after the spike, we've had a steady decrease now for the past couple of years, where this year um, we've only lost six, six rhino. So uh, again, very impressive relative, uh, I think, to the, to the rest of Africa. So, so what is really sort of driving a lot of these improvements? Now, if we just look at this map, this was before, with the Minnesota Zoo's help, we started this Rhino Ranger program. As Save the Rhino Trust was basically out here all by ourselves. We had four teams 
based across, again, this huge range from the metro area all the way up to north of Brainerd. Imagine the size that, that these four teams had to cover. Now, after we started our community-based program, look at how that landscape changes. Save the Rhino Trust have been able to split some of their teams and work more with the Rangers. We've got a number of teams that are just Rangers, just community uh, Ranger teams working with tourism companies. And, if you remember that logo, my wife's company, IRDNC, we've also managed to pull them in from their general community work to help us with, with Rhino patrols. So we've more than tripled the number of teams that are actually out on any given day uh, doing, rhino, doing uh, rhino work. We've also made some great achievements um, in, in law enforcement. And I, some of you may have heard about the Chinese that were arrested a couple of years ago in Namibia for trying to smuggle out 14 rhino horns. Now everybody thought they're gonna get off scot-free or they're gonna get away with a little slap on the wrist because Namibia also is very, very supportive of the Chinese like a lot of African countries. Look at that, 14 years. The maximum is 20. This is the stiffest sentence that anybody in Namibia has gotten. Anybody. Even the guys that have been caught in red-handed poaching. So this was a huge, huge victory and sent, I think, an incredibly important message, especially out to the rest of the Chinese in Namibia, that this kind of nonsense is, is simply not going to be tolerated. So where are we heading now? Um, we're moving off. Um, we've got lots of things on the table. One of the big things is we're hoping to still double the number of, of rangers working uh, in tourism. First as a way again to finance their work but also to try and spread more of those benefits out to some of the broader communities. And if you look last year, last year 200,000 US dollars was generated by these rangers. This money was never there before. These rangers that we have trained with support from Minnesota generated $200,000 straight back into their communities. It's a pretty big amount of money, way more than a lot of the other tourism activities. Like I said, we're also spreading into uh, outreach work, and we're very, very lucky to have this guy here. Uh, this is Henry Mapunga. He is an old retired principal, and he's also a farmer. He's also a headman. He's a very, very respected local individual and he is itching you know these retired school teachers uh, my mom's one of them and she she's only been out for one year and she's already going crazy she's got to go do something so he's going to be leading a lot of our work on the ground he's already been busy here with some of his ex uh, colleagues at the school he's been working with some of the school kids uh, this was on world rhino day uh, the kids just make little rhino friend um, name tags they did some coloring like some of our kids did here uh, but we're very, very excited for this uh, program to go around. And I just wanted to bring all this back again. I know I've mentioned it a few times, but it's so important that we understand that a lot of this work, a lot of these achievements have come from Minnesota. It really has, and I'm, 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 I'm not just saying that. And that whole Rhino Ranger program wouldn't have happened if we couldn't have organized this simple event in 2012 Thanks to Melissa and the Foundation for putting it on, we were able to raise a decent amount of money to get this project going off the ground. That one event kick-started this whole thing that has now taken over Rhino Conservation in Namibia. Everybody talks about the Community Rhino Ranger Program, Community Rhino Ranger Program. It all started here in Minnesota. And speaking of soda, I have to give a very brief update because actually I haven't for a while because there was nothing to share and I was a bit nervous to say anything because we weren't quite sure what had happened to soda. Minnesota's namesake rhino, if, if some of you don't know or aren't aware, um, when the zoo joined forces with Save the Rhino Trust in 2009, we, um, we gave a namesake rhino in honor of the zoo's support. So Northwest Namibia has a rhino named Soda moving around. In January 2015, you can see um, he also has been part of the government's dehorning project to try and safeguard him. But after that, we lost him. We didn't know what happened to him. He literally disappeared for almost 18 months. And now in June, he popped up again. And because we keep good records of all of these earmarks and we know all of our rhinos, and we actually looked at his nose wrinkles and we were able to tell because we didn't believe that this was soda because he had moved over a hundred miles across this landscape, across those mountains 
into this area just on the edge of the range. So we're super, super excited to find him alive. However, he has moved into an area that has been hit by poachers. So we're very nervous. Um, Save the Rhino Trust, I know, have been busy having a team out there on a regular basis. So we're hoping that, that Soda can stay out of harm's way. Um, but, but we'll see. We'll see. He's a, he's a tough little guy. <laughs> so I'm getting to the end of my stories here. And, and I wanted to save one of the best for the last. And this guy actually doesn't work for Save the Rhino Trust. Um, he doesn't work for the Rhino Ranger program, but he is a local, and he is a local farmer. And he's also got a great story because he's also risen out of his farm, and he has become one of the top guides at Desert Rhino Camp. Um, and what he did, and what I want to share with you now, um, the thing I like best about it is that I actually had very little, if, if anything, to do with it. And... Um, it's, it's very, very amazing, and you'll see what, 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 what Bones has done. He's, he's going to introduce the song, the Desert Rhino Camp song, which he and his fellow staff wrote in honor of the rhino. So I'm just going to play a short little video here, and you guys can sort of um, enjoy being around the campfire at Desert Rhino Camp for a, a few minutes. If you listen carefully, um, when, when people in Namibia, in northwest Namibia, when they talk about the rhinos. They don't say those rhinos, these rhinos, the government's rhinos. They talk about our, our rhinos. Like, they really believe that these are their rhinos and they have to protect them. And that is a big, big difference um, for a lot of other people, um, a lot of other places across Africa. So, in closing, I want to take you guys back now to the beginning a little bit. So, um, you guys remember um, this big question, and if um, this isn't for you, it's okay. I understand that, but there are some other ways that you can help, so um, don't be too worried. Um, the most critical thing is that protecting rhinos is expensive, but it doesn't mean that you have to be a billionaire um, to support us. Um, these guys all get performance-based bonuses for pictures, to get great pictures like this, it just costs even five dollars is enough to really, really motivate these guys to work extra hard to get these things. A pair of boots, 50 bucks. These guys wear, wear their boots out quite quickly, but uh, they do get put to good use. Um, you know, they usually last about a year. And supporting guys like Boss, he does earn a little bit more than the trackers because he's leading the program. But for $500 a month, um, you know, you can make a significant uh, contribution to rhino conservation. One of the other things that we, we do here at the zoo, which I can say personally makes a huge difference because I get to hand deliver these great letters from, from Minnesotans to the trackers. They, they get sort of you know, individualized and I get to deliver them. Um, these guys just think they're the greatest thing ever. They get the biggest, biggest smile on their face. And I know I've seen them tacked up you know, with, with little rusty nails in their houses uh, back at home. It's a, it's a great little initiative. Something that everybody likes, um, come and visit us. Come see how we work. Um, come out with one of our trackers um, and let them show you their rhino. And that money also helps uh, support these guys. The Minnesota Zoo does do trips. We're trying to get some more trips. <laughs> um, but this is the first uh, zoo-sponsored trip with the, the previous uh, CEO and President Lee Emke. Um, I think it was a lot of fun. We had a great time out at Desert Rhino Camp. So, Stay tuned, hopefully the zoo will be sponsoring a few more trips. And of course, sharing our story. I mean, I think we're absolutely so fortunate to have somebody like Sven as a, as a big local ally now to talk about what we're doing in Namibia. Facebook, Twitter, um, doesn't seem like people talk that much anymore in person, but if it's <laughs> something you also enjoy doing, um, you know, please remember the rhinos. Um, share that story uh, about the rhinos. And I just wanted to say really quick again um, how special and how important it is both to me personally but also to all of our friends um, and colleagues uh, in Namibia. You know, thank you guys so much for the support. Again, without it, um, we would not be uh, where we are uh, today. So we hope to see you in Namibia sometime and I'm going to be sticking around uh, for a, a few questions. So thank you very much.
think you can just raise your hand. And don't worry, I won't ask you to go to Namibia and go hiking. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. For black rhinos, about 16 to 18 months. Quite long. Double, double us. Yep. Yeah, we do have areas where more rhinos exist in, excuse me, um, more rhinos do exist, and it usually depends on the number of, of springs, water availability, and often where the rainfall patterns were that year. Um, not because they eat grass, but because a lot of the, the browse, the, the vegetation becomes a lot uh, more juicy and nutrient rich, rich where there, there is rain. So you do get a little bit of movement. Rhinos will not migrate far, but you, know, you will get small um, congregations. And you often find them together just after the rains have started because that's when the males will start um, looking for the females to breed, when the females will come into estrus. So. Yep, and we do have a big variation. Some places, quite a few rhinos, some places, very few. Yep? Well, I'm curious about the dehorning and whether that makes a difference in poaching or not. And if it does, why do you consider more of it done? It's, it's a great question. And, you know, dehorning is a very controversial uh, intervention. Dehorning is when uh, typically the government or veterinarians will take off, remove part of the horn as a deterrent to poaching, because poachers just want the horn, right? So just remove it, and hopefully you'll remove that incentive. The, the struggle is the, there's a number of problems and challenges with that. The first one is that in most cases, it's very expensive to capture a rhino, especially in our area. It costs 10 to 20,000 US dollars just to capture one rhino. You've got to have a helicopter, a fixed wing airplane, lots of guys on the ground. Um, so. It's just worth a lot of money. It costs a lot of money. The horn also grows back. Remember, the horn is like 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 carrot, uh, like a fingernail keratin. So every two years, that horn is going to almost become back to normal. So you've got to keep doing this. And what we've learned from the poachers um, is that because you can't take the whole horn off, you have to leave a little bit because they have a, a sort of a knob with some blood vessels in it. Even that small little bit at the bottom is enough. Well, it's, it's worth thousands of dollars, even that small little bit today. So poachers are willing to still do that. The other problem is that poachers still often have to track the rhino to kill them. Sometimes they have to track just like our teams do all day, up mountains. When they come to a rhino that had its horn cut off, do you think they want to track that rhino again? No. So what's the easy way to solve that problem? They shoot it anyway. So it's tough. When, when you have a farm with rhinos, especially like white rhinos that are very docile, they're basically like cows, they're right next to the road, you can dart them very easy and cheaply, and then you can also monitor them very well, it's been quite successful. Um, in other places, not so much. Yep, yeah, this side. Uh, what's the best way to tell the rhinos apart from nose wrinkles or the ear markings or something else? Yeah, we, we focus mainly on two, the, the ears and the horn. So the horn shapes are usually all different, but what we do, if you noticed, especially even soda, um, there's a number of ways rhinos get their earmarks. They get them naturally in the bush, sometimes running through brush, the males fight, um, or the government, usually when they capture rhinos, they put notches in. Soda has, we call them man-made notches, and they have different coating systems for each individual. Um, so that's the, that's the easy way of telling them apart. But some rhinos don't have any marks on their ears and their horns can be very deceiving. So nose wrinkles are just like your, your, your fingerprints. And we've learned that if you get a really good photograph, and that's why we focus so hard on teaching our guys to take good photos, is that you can zoom in and get a really good comparative shot. If you looked at two rhinos right next to each other, it's clear as day that they're completely different. It's actually really cool. Yep. Yep. We've tried, again, it, it, not in our area. Everything in our area becomes more difficult. <laughs> um, we've, uh, you can't put on the normal collars like you can with animals. The shape of the rhino neck just doesn't work. They've tried this in zoos even to figure a way to do it and they haven't succeeded. So what they end up doing is putting a little transmitter in the horn. 
So it's got um, you know a small little antenna that has to stick out. And what happens is, is that rhinos like to rub their horn on stuff. They also like to fight. So we found that those things lasted about three months. Um, it also has to be filled with poxy, and that poxy gets really, really hot. And when it's 130 degrees out, it gets really, really hot. And we think that also helped to malfunction those. What we did use that did work um, were these, we actually put um, tracking devices on their ankles, just like a, a, a collar bracelet, but, but made for their, their ankles. And those actually did work. Um, they did work okay. But again, they're very expensive. Um, and, you know, they only last about 18 months. So, yeah, we found that our guys on foot, they do just as good of a job. They find the rhinos almost as often as, as we really need. So, uh, much more cost effective solution. Yep. Another great question, yeah. I mean, it, you look at this problem, and again, you sort of think, guys, we're never going to really stop this if we don't stop the demand. The demand is really what's driving, ultimately, the poaching. And thankfully, there are some really great organizations that are working in Asia very, very hard. One is um, called Wild Aid, and what they do is they focus on social media. So if you've, you know, obviously I think you've probably heard of Yao Ming, um, Jackie Chan. What they do is they enlist a lot of local celebrities and they get them to tell a message um, to the people that, hey, this just isn't cool. Like having a rhino horn, giving a rhino horn as a gift is, is really completely ridiculous. And they make some fantastic ad advertisements that they do play. Um, around China, and they have they have measured some uh, decreases in, in consumption. I, I know one of their most successful has been with with bear uh, gall gallbladder bile, which is also a big problem in China. Farming um, bile out of, out of bears, and they've also used their social marketing um, quite successful. But it's a big debate um, whether or not it's going to be fast enough um, to save to save the rhino. So. Yep. Well, um, we focus on rhinos, but I think by default, you know, we end up producing a lot of other information that's useful for other species. For example, oftentimes when I go through all the patrol photos, I will find pictures of lions. I would say almost every second or third patrol, there's the guys will see lions. We have another lion biologist that's working in our area, so I always share photographs with him, um, and he can use them for whatever he likes. He reciprocates by sharing some of his rhino photos um, with us. Um, there's also elephant poaching um, out there. So our guys out in the field, I mean, there's no doubt that having boots on the ground is one of the best proactive measures to try and keep poaching out. And in fact, We've interviewed and interrogated people that have been arrested for poaching. And we've asked them, you guys were poaching in Atosha Park. Atosha Park is, is east of where we're at. It's actually a very high rhino population. We asked them, why didn't you poach in, in, in Northwest? Why didn't you poach in Atosha? And they said, well, we actually went there. We went there first because we thought, heck, this is, this is unprotected land. This is community land. This should be easy. But every place we went to, there were people out on patrol. So we said, ah, oh, bugger this. We're going to go over here. We actually have this on tape. Um, so we know it works. And certainly, you know, the guys are, are that presence is helping protect, you know, other animals as well. Yep. Are you just focusing mostly on black rhinos? I know there's the northern white rhinos you mentioned. And I don't know if they're in the same area, but also the Indian rhinos. Is it basically just black rhinos that are close to extinction? Well, well, no, they're not the only one close to extinction, but they're the only ones that we're focusing on in our neck of the woods. So yeah, we're, we're working with the southwestern black rhino, which is also a subspecies of black rhino, but about 95% of that subspecies are, are in Namibia. And Namibia has about a third of the world's black rhino, about 1,500. So, yeah. Yep. Have you had uh, much success in uh, preventing the uh, horns from being taken from uh, the country and uh, exported, containing them? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of seizures, not nearly as many as poached rhinos that we know 
have taken place. This, this one that I showed you with the Chinese was, was by far the largest, 14 rhino horns. And we do know that those were from Namibia. They've been DNA tested, and that definitely helped, I think, with the conviction um, in the case. Um, but with the other ones, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And the, the biggest challenge is that you know, Namibia borders on Angola and Zambia and Zimbabwe. And it's those access points into those corrupt, more corrupt countries where you have a, a much bigger challenge. And Namibia, thankfully, is, is less corrupt. It's much more stable. Um, but if there is a weakness, we're still trying to work on law enforcement. You know, we haven't had to deal with wildlife crime for so long. Um, a lot of the, the policemen, the magistrates, um, customs officials, immigration, they, they don't know how to deal with this kind of crime. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a process, but um, we're learning a lot from South Africa. So thankfully there is, is, is good exchange, and we hope that we can keep, keep improving on that. Yeah, we're, we're almost exactly 50-50 right now. It sort of varies a little bit. I think the last census we did five years ago, there was a little bit more females than males. Um, but this population was believed to be down to about 30 individuals. Unfortunately, we've had two different biologists, geneticists actually, come out, collect samples, and have failed <laughs> to finish their study. So, we have not been able to get a good handle on the genetic composition of the population, but it's a, it's a really crucial question. And now with the security issues, it's even harder to get foreigners um, in to do that, that type of research. But we're hoping that with the DNA that's being collected for the horns, which is a big regional project uh, based in South Africa, that we might be able to get some cooperation there to look at genetic diversity as sort of an offshoot from this more security focused um, um, effort. But yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think I'm, uh, I'm slowly getting creeped on here. <laughs> Never. Never. Should I take one more or are we done? If you, uh, if there's one more. Can I get one more? One more? Yep, go ahead. So how are you getting the baseline genetics of the individual rhinos? Is that from feces? Or? No, we're actually taking it from horns. So part of the, the project is to actually DNA every single living rhino that we can. So the government has a huge national dehorning operation that they are doing. They're also doing it in our area. They're not, they've probably only been able to get about 70% of the rhinos, but every rhino that they dehorn, they take a, a bit of that horn and they send that off for DNA analysis. Thank you guys very much. I'm going to stick around too. If you want to ask more questions, I'll be down here. Do you know what an honor it is to work at the Minnesota Zoo and to work with somebody like Jeff Montefiering and to be associated with the kind of work that he and Save the Rhino Trust are doing in Namibia? Thank you. Um, we just feel so privileged to, to, to be a part of your life. So thank you, Jeff. So one of the things that, and you should come up here because I want Jeff to be up here, you know, one of the things he mentioned at the very beginning, he was asking our questions about, you know, how do we help um, his work in Namibia, and I was there for a long time with my arm up, my hand up, and then when you said 125 degrees, that was it, Jeff. <laughs> I'm out of there. So the other way we can help Jeff, and Jeff certainly talked about this tonight, um, we would like to invite you to help support Jeff and save the Rhino Trust and the work that we're doing to protect the black rhino in Namibia. This is critically important work and every gift counts. And I just want to give you a sense of the ownership that we have here at the Minnesota Zoo for this project. Our zookeepers came together recently and just uh, through the AAZK came together and raised over $10,000 in this past week for Jeff and his work in Namibia. And I really want to applaud those zookeepers for that, that effort. Um, they did a terrific job. But it's 
that's also just an indicative, I think, that if zookeepers here at the zoo can go out and raise 10,000 bucks in just a couple of days, they did a bowling uh, event last night, what can we all jo do to join them? So, I would like, again, to invite you to help support uh, saving the black rhino in Namibia. When you leave tonight, we have a form. Um, if you would like to fill it out uh, tonight, that would be terrific, or send it in. Uh, we hope you will support our efforts. We need to raise, we'd love to raise $50,000 this year for Jeff and his um, activities. So we thank you for considering a gift. Um, and you can certainly just write this as a pledge and we will follow up with you to get additional information. Thank you so much and thank you for all your support of the Minnesota Zoo. We can't do our work without each and every one of you and we really value your partnership with us. Have a great evening and thanks for joining us and I know Jeff will stick around to answer more questions. So thank you.